It's Easter Sunday. And we celebrate that Jesus, who, who died on Friday on a cross to pay for our sins, was raised victorious on Sunday morning. We, we celebrate that he proved he was God by his resurrection. He proved that what he did at the cross paid for our sin forevermore. That whatever life brings, the power of the resurrection comes to bear in the lives of his people and we are victorious in Christ. Now this story of Easter, and it, it's easy to do this if you've been coming to church for a long time. You say, well, I've heard this story. I wonder what, like, I wonder what Chad's going to talk about today. Well, you probably had a pretty good idea what Chad was going to talk about today on Easter. Because it's the same thing I've talked about a lot of years on Easter. The story doesn't change. Jesus, who died on the cross on Friday, raised from the dead on Sunday, victorious over sin, death, and hell. And that's what we're going to talk about. But this is not a story that you can say, okay, it's Easter. And we told the story. Now we can close up the book and we can wait for next year. Because this, this story intersects our lives, and it intersects the circumstances of life at multiple levels in multiple ways. And we're going to start today, now this is not going to encourage some of you, uh, because we're going to start in Genesis. And the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at a passage in Exodus. And then we'll only have 64 more books in the Bible to go through before the 1030 service. So we're going to be covering some ground here today, right? Okay, here we go. So we're going to start out in Genesis, all the way back to the story of the Garden of Eden. And here's what I want you to hear. So Adam and Eve, they sin. They disobey God. They it sin against God, and God determined that the man and the woman would have to be barred from, barred from the garden because, first of all, this has created a relationship problem between them and their God. And... This is the place where God dwells. God walks with them and talks with them. The tree of life, the source of life and eternal life, life that would never end is located there. And God bars the way. Here's what the Bible says. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, cherubim. Sometimes people think about cherubs, cherubim, they think about the, the chubby little flying angel things and say, oh, the cher cherubs, no. Cherubim's a little different image. This is more an image of, they are fierce angelic warriors. Uh, there's, they're not given a lot of room and they are, they are standing now between God and man in the gar at the interest of the garden to serve as a warning, as an object lesson. And this continues on. The way is shut. The door is closed. Because of our sin, we're separated from God. We can no longer be where God is, no longer walk and talk with God. God can no longer be near. They can't be near the source of life. Instead, a series of curses come down upon man and upon the creation itself in the book of Genesis that now... Man will live out his days alone, die, return to the dust from which he was taken. And here's what the Bible tells us. The sin of Adam and Eve came to infect us all. That we are, we are born into this world with, instead of I'm trying to do, do right, I'm trying to follow God, we are born with an inclination that in fact is away from God. We're pulling against God. We're, re, we're born with a rebellious nature toward God. We, we call it a sin nature, but it's not just that. It's not just that we have that inclination. We, we're going to choose it. We're going to make choices throughout life that says, I, I don't think I should follow what God says. I think I have a better plan than God. I'm going to live my own way. And that's the nature of sin. That, and sin causes this broken relationship. It's a barrier between us and God. And like the cherubim standing there, guard at the garden, we're separated from God. Okay, now we advance. Now we're to Exodus. So see, we got Genesis knocked out. Now we're to Exodus. In the book of Exodus, God tells Moses, as they're traveling on the Exodus, he says, build a tabernacle. It's a portable place of worship. This is the place where my presence is going to be especially felt and known. It's a place of worship. And there are, there are multiple pieces to this tabernacle puzzle and, and levels of access to God until finally you get to the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And here's what you get in the Holy of Holies. Because this is 
the, the very special place. The, the high priest only gets in there once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer a blood sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. And even then at the threat of his life that he does anything slightly outside of what God said for the high priest to do. So this is this, is this place. But, but the, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, it is separated. The presence of God from the people, the sinful people, by a curtain, by a veil. This is the part of the story that a lot of people have missed. And is it that curtain? One of the things that God said, he gave really specific instructions about the whole tabernacle, what was supposed to be there, what was not going to be there, how it worked, what it would look like. And on that curtain, God said, and I want you to, I want you to stitch a symbol on the curtain. And you find this in Exodus, the cherubim. I want the symbol of the cherubim to be on that curtain because I want you to continue to remember all the way back from the Garden of Eden and everything since then, sin separates from God. And the symbol of the cherubim still standing as a, as a guard, as a barrier between sinful people and a holy God. That, that curtain, blood, blood red. And all through the years, because this carries over to the temple that Solomon will build later, all through the years, through the decades the centuries, that curtain faces outward. And it reminds people that the way to God's presence is closed because of sin. That there's a barrier guarded by a cherubim and there's no doubt in their mind that the way has been closed. A barrier stands between us and God and, and somewhere there's a stirring in hearts that there's a question. Will the way ever be opened again? Will the path be cleared ever Way, W-A-Y, is a common word in the Bible. In, in my translation, I'm using the English Standard Version today. Uh, in my translation, the word way occurs 756 times in my translation. Most of the time, of those 756, it's referring to the way you live your life, the pattern of your life, the course of your life, and how you choose to live life. That's the way. And God by his divine nature, is very interested in that, in the way of our lives, in the way it goes and, and the way he wants it to go. And God, of all the ways that you think about God, think about him as one who, who likes to make a way, where there doesn't seem to be a way. I want to give you some examples. Here's one. The way to relationship to God, this goes back to the Genesis 3. He drove out the man east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God said there's a barrier. He established the way is blocked. If God established this is, that the way is blocked, God's the only one that can open the way. That makes it very important to hear what God has to say about that. Another, the way to overcoming life's obstacles. Any of you facing any obstacles today? Anybody coming up against a wall that you can't get through? Anybody have, a, have something that's so heavy, so big, so frightening that right now it just seems like I'm stuck. I'm stuck in life and it's a relationship thing or it's illness or it's a job or it's, it's any number of things that it, the way is blocked. This passage from Isaiah points back to the Exodus and to the greatest redemptive event in the Old Testament. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. It goes back to the story of the Red Sea being parted. God's people backs against the Red Sea, no place to go. The Egyptian army charging forward, and God, where there is no way, he opens a way. Water walls up on both sides, and the people cross through on dry land. Because God makes a way where there is no way. The way through life's challenges. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. That as you go through life, God makes a way to say, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to see if you really believe or not. I'm going to see if you're going to follow me or not. I'm going to give you choices over and over and over again. And you're going to either choose for me or against me. But I'm going to test you. I'm going to see what's in your heart. I, I want to see if you're really, really going to be my people. The way you should live your life, trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Okay, what about 20% of my ways? What about 50% of my ways? 70% of my ways? In all your ways, acknowledge him. 
and he'll make straight your paths. And then the way, the way to heaven for all eternity. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, not one of many choices, not the way plus my religious activity. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But until Jesus, the way is barred. It's blocked. We're, we're dead in our tracks. And for all those thousands of years, you have between Edom, Eden and the cross, these cherubim, they're carrying out their mission, a symbol of separation between sinful people and a holy, perfect God because there's rebellion. There's rebellion between the creator and his creation. There's rebellion between a holy God and people who, by nature and by choice, are in rebellion against that holy God. The relationship between people and God is broken. Broken, uh, for me, has been such a vivid word uh, and, and becoming more vivid. For, for many of our people, we're, we're sharing the gospel a whole lot more than we've ever shared it before. And broken is a word that resonates, I think, with a lot of people. Because don't you feel the brokenness in our world? Man, I do. Did you watch the news this weekend? Is Syria broken? Is North Korea broken? Is, is the United States of America pretty broken? The, the world is broken, and we see it in violence, and we see it in hatred, and we see it in evil at the, at the deepest levels, conflict, fear, just meanness. The world is, is a broken place. But we can bring that down to another level easily because we're kind of broken too. And it's not hard to find evidence, not hard to see it, not hard to feel it. Life is hard. Life is harsh. Also, on Easter, are you willing to be a little bit honest? If we're a little bit honest, we're kind of hard and harsh too. We can be mean people. We treat others badly. A lot of the difficulties in the world are because we're, maybe we, things we say, things we do, things we don't say and don't do, broken. Sometimes we hurt, sometimes we hurt others. The world is broken. And, and as a resident of this world, uh, we feel broken too. Now, when things are broken, when life is broken, when it isn't working the way we think it ought to, and we feel that this isn't how it's supposed to work, it's not how it's supposed to feel, we, we start trying to patch it up and put it back together and make it work somehow by our many efforts. So we'll try all sorts of things to soothe our consciences to medicate our pains, to distract us from the things that are actually the real issue at the heart of us, something that'll give us temporary happiness. It's a duct tape, bailing wire kind of way of, well, this makes me feel a little better if I spend some money on stuff or if I travel or if I pour myself into this or I chase after that. And we try to figure it out on our own. Proverbs, and <laughs> it gets a pretty good response to that. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It seems like it ought to work. It seems like it should help. And we'll try any number of things instead of, instead of listening to God, and its way leads to death. In Romans, my Bible reading this morning, I read the first three chapters of Romans. and Romans 1.23, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Instead of, okay, here's what God said. I don't want to do what God said. That's the nature, that, that's a great definition of sin. God said, and I said I'm going to do something different than that. We try to fix it ourselves. Here's what I want you to notice. We look around this world, and it's not hard to see the brokenness of the world and the brokenness of lives, and we feel it, and we experience it. We walk those paths with people and in our own lives, the brokenness. But if you look around a little more, you still see beauty, and you still see happiness, and you still see joy. I, I love springtime, even if it brings all my allergies to bear on my existence. I love springtime in North Texas as trees are out, flowers, and 
You know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. That the creation is the Bible of God's handiwork in this world. Declaring the presence, the power, the perfect design of God. And the Bible tells us that's how God designed it. In the beginning, God didn't design the world broken. That's why we're so, we feel so rotten and broken. Because God designed the world to work perfectly, that everything fit together, everything connected, everything in harmony, all people, all, the creation itself, in harmony. God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. It says, Genesis 1, and God made each of us with a purpose, and that purpose to worship him, to love him, to walk through life with him in close relationship, just like you see in, before sin came into the world with Adam and Eve. That's God's design. Here's what I want you to get to. What I had to get to. What I had to discover in my own life years ago. Life doesn't work when we ignore God and ignore his design for our lives. Who knows better than God how life should work? Because he's the one who made us. He's the one who created us. He knows the purpose for which we exist. For which we breathe. And God's desire is not that we ignore his design, but that we get back to his plan. Instead, we selfishly insist on doing things on our own, our own way. And the Bible calls that sin. And sin just is a distortion of the design God created. And the consequence of sin, the consequence of the separation from God is, is just struggle in this life. And then the wages of sin is death, separation. We, we die in brokenness. We die separated from God for eternity. Okay, I'm glad I could give you this uplifting note about sin and brokenness. But honestly, you walked in here feeling it. You walked in here knowing it. But we need a, we need a remedy. And one of the things I, I thank God for on Easter Sunday, the whole message of when we talk about Good Friday and Jesus dead on the cross, Saturday in between where all hope seemed to be lost and so many people are living in Friday and Saturday and they never get around to Sunday where the good news comes in. God did not want to leave us in brokenness. And that's why Jesus comes. God in human flesh. And he came to this earth to teach us God's design. But he didn't just teach it, he lived it. He modeled it, he showed us. This is what life looks like when you're walking in a relationship to God. This is what it looks like when you're, when you're living in the middle of God's perfect design for you. Jesus came to do what we could not do for ourselves. He paid for our sin at the cross. By his death, the sinless son of God, how did Jesus dying on a cross pay for the sin for all the world for all time? Because, not because of how bad he suffered on the cross, because of where he came from to suffer on the cross. He came from the glory of heaven to this earth to suffer the shame and the pain of the cross. And that distance between where he came from and what he experienced was enough to pay for all sin for all time. He was raised from the dead to provide the only way that we could be rescued, we could be restored to a relationship to God. I, I want to read a couple of verses and get the, first, get the next one up there. We're going to do this together. This may be the biggest faith step I take all day today. We're going to read this together. Here we go. This is one of the most familiar verses in the Bible. It's from the ESV. It may be a little different than the way you've heard it or memorized it. So let's do it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Not perish separated from God forever and ever, but instead have eternal life. This next verse, we'll read, you did so good, we'll read this one together. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. What did God do with our sin? He took our sin, nailed it to the cross of Christ, that Jesus would pay our sin debt. Now, simply hearing this good news, this is the, this is the key part of this. Because again, it's Easter Sunday, and you're here at church with your family, with your friends. You're here, and you say, oh, I've heard this story before. Yeah, so is Satan. He's not going to be in heaven with you. How, boy, that scared some of you, didn't it? Uh, it's not enough just to know this story. You have to respond to it. You have to, you have to reach out and, and take. You have to put, a, put faith in it. You have to turn some things around. 
simply hearing this is not enough. We need to admit to God because we, we try to justify and we try to manipulate and we try to rationalize our sin. It's just saying, God, yeah, I'm broken. I can't fix me. I can't fix my world. can't fix my marriage. can't fix my family. I need your help, and I'm, I'm helpless. So I'm putting all my faith in what Jesus did at the cross to pay for my sin, and, and I'm not holding anything back. And I want Jesus not just to I understand the sin part, but I want to turn away from broken's not working for me and my plan's not working. I want to turn toward your design. And I want, I want Jesus to be like the, the king in my life. He's Lord. He's master. He's in charge. I'm switching plans. I want to get on God's plan. Here's how the Bible talks about it. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. It's not about all the things you do because some people, in response to the Easter message, in spite of everything the Bible says, people still say, well, I believe Jesus did that, so starting today, I'm going to try harder. They're not saved by that. Well, I'm... I'm okay because uh, I'm not on God's design plan, but I'm still doing my own thing. But, but I got baptized once. I got confirmed once. Uh, I'm, I'm in church on Easter, kicking and screaming, but I came. Well, you, you, can, you can come up with your little resume of religious activities. I'm a good person. You look around, you say, I'm better than the people I'm sitting around. I can look at them and tell they're a bunch of heathens. can't be based on what we do. It has to be based on what, on what Jesus did. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's a gift from God. We accept the gift. Here's how it talks about it in the Bible. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Just declare it. He's Lord. Not just as an intellectual concept, but as the practice of your life. He's in charge. He's the king. He's the leader. He's the master of my life. I'm going to follow his plan with all my heart for the rest of my days. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. That what he did at the cross paid the debt, but then that he was raised victorious over sin and death and hell, and it proved he was, truly was God. If you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's what happens. God takes what's broken, and he puts it back together. And he restores our relationship to him, and we begin to discover meaning and purpose in a broken world. And now we're free because we're empowered by God to pursue God's design with all our heart, to be a part of his mission in the world. And even when we fail at perfection, which we're probably going to fail at perfection, we're not knocked off the path of pursuing the design, God's pathway of being restored. And this same good news the Holy Spirit empowers us to pursue it. Here's how the Bible talks about it. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. This is more than a self-improvement plan in the Christian life. It's not just, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do more religious stuff, more good deeds. He gives us the desire and then the power to fulfill the desire. That's the nature of, of the gospel and what it does. Now, when you've heard the good news of Jesus, God, God always invites us to respond. Again, it's not enough to know this story. You have to do something with it. You have to respond to it. God's waiting for your yes. He's reaching out in love and grace. He's inviting you to reach back in faith and commitment. And I'm not going through the rest of the sermon without giving you a chance to do it. We are lost from God. He is reaching out to us in love and grace. and He just wants you to say yes. You don't have to have it all figured out. It's not, well, I'm going to clean my life up and then I'll, then I'll be ready to make that. You just start where you are. That's where God takes us where we are and he creates, he creates the desire and the power in us to become what he's created us to be. If you have never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Isn't that amazing? You can do that right now. Not, well, uh, over the next six months, you can start working on this. No, right now, in a moment. Your eternity can be changed, your sin forgiven, a powerful life, a part of every day of life. And I want to lead you in the kind of commitment prayer. This is not, you have to say this, these words, this formula, but it's just expressing your heart to God to say yes to Him. And so I invite you to bow your heads right now. I'm going to pray this out loud, and maybe you would pray it silently after me as a way to express your own heart to God. And maybe you would say, 
Dear God, my life is broken. And I recognize it's because of my own sin. I, I need you. I believe Jesus came to live and to die. And he was raised from the dead to rescue me from my sin. Please forgive me. I want to turn from my selfish ways and put my trust in Jesus. I believe Jesus is God. And I will follow him with all my heart. For the rest of my days. In Jesus name. Amen. And here's what God's word promises about that. It says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Will be saved. Now we talked last week about. Uh, some of you have been in church for a while. And you've heard a lot about Greek words. And the real root meaning of Greek, word, Greek words. So everyone is a really important word. Do you know what, in the literal Greek, you know what everyone means? It means everyone. That's all it means. It means everybody, anywhere, all the time, who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, now we're to the sermon. Mark 15. Mark 15. This is in the middle of the story of Jesus on the cross. And if you put the different gospel accounts, they all see it from, from different, it's like reporters seeing a story from different angles, and we get different parts of the story from the different gospels. So this is Mark's, which he receives from Simon Peter, we believe. Verse 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Uh, as we piece together the gospels, we believe that the loud cry was, it is finished. Uh, Greek word, to telestai, it means, it was an accounting term, paid in full. The debt's paid. Everything that needed to be paid for sin has been paid. To telestai, it is finished, and he breathed his last. Now, verse 38 is the one that circles back to the beginning of the message. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Huh. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So he started out talking about the temple and talking about the veil and talking about this great curtain that separated the holy place from sinful people. And it's shielding a holy God from sinful man and we read this miraculous moment here in Mark 15 when the great curtain of the temple was torn in two. At the moment Jesus died, this symbol of separation between brokenness and the wholeness of God is torn in two, stitch by stitch. And not only was it ripped apart, but it was ripped from top to bottom. See, it wasn't, people might have tried to work it from the bottom. It's the top. To the bottom. Well, that's a different story. The veil was a barrier, remember, that made sure that man could not carelessly, uh, irreverently, sinfully enter God's awesome presence. And the presence of God shielded by this thick curtain throughout the history of Israel. And then at the death of Christ, it all changed. And the curtain was torn in half from top to bottom. And only God could have done this incredible feat. That's, uh, that's pretty close to scale. It's, uh, the curtain in the Jerusalem temple was 60 feet tall, about 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. And stitched into the curtain, what they would have seen looking there. And you see some of the image, the gold image on the blood red curtain, the image of the cherubim. Still standing guard, still blocking the way, still a reminder all the way back to Genesis when sin entered the world. And God had to make the way, and only through the cross of Christ could the way be made. And as the veil is torn, here's what happens God's presence is now accessible, the way is no longer blocked. Jesus has atoned, paid for our sins, made us right before God. The torn veil illustrated Jesus' body, broken for us, 
opening the way for us to come to God. And Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross. He said the redemptive plan. He just said the redemptive plan. God's plan for everything that needed to be paid for sin is all paid up. The plan is now complete. The way is open. You know, the Holy of Holies that, that opens up here when the curtain is torn, it represents the very presence of God. Like be a symbol in all kinds of ways throughout Old Testament, New Testament of, of heaven itself, access to the heavenly throne room. So the cherubim finally get a day off after all these centuries. They're finally done. But there's still one standing between a holy God and sinful man. Except this time it's Jesus. And he doesn't stand with a flaming sword barring the way. But instead he stands with open arms of love and grace and he says, come. This is, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, one of the great invitation verses of the Bible. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. How many of you came in today weary and carrying heavy burdens? And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Any of you in desperate need of some soul rest today? For my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. The way is forever open to all who would come. And the way is made open through Jesus who died on the cross and was raised from the dead on the third day. And he made a way for you and he's still making a way for you. He is the way maker. And he's for you. So... So I want to invite you today just to take a faith step, to take a, a trust Jesus step. And some of you today, this is your day. You've, you've been waiting for this. God, you're, you're here by divine appointment. God wanted you to be here to say yes to Jesus. And you're going to say, I'm, I want to trust Jesus for my forgiveness of sin, just to carry me through life for for eternity in heaven, I'm putting all my trust in him. Some of you today say, the way is blocked for me, and I need things to open up. And I need to trust Jesus to open up what is, what is blocked. Some of you need to say, there's direction for my life, and it's so cloudy where the road goes from here. And I just need, I need to put my trust in Jesus to fix it. And, and what happens is that he, he's still just making ways. He's still just opening doors. He, is, he, he loves you and he is for you. And his plan is perfect. And are you willing to lay down your plans and say, I'm embracing his design. He's, he's already opened the door. I just need to take a faith step and walk through it and step into his arms today. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Entrust your crisis to Christ. Trust life direction to Christ. He is made a way.